been in Santa Barbara since 2001. I started my practice in 99 in Ojai. So I've been um, uh, a practicing chiropractor for a good number of years now. And um, I don't know how much you've read about what it is I do. Um, I've developed a system of muscle testing. I, um, I got the concept early on that, that the body knows, you know, the body has all the answers. You know, that, that we each have an intelligence within us that knows what we need to get well and knows what's out of balance. And if we can somehow learn to listen, I mean, what's more healing? Somebody who kind of talks at you or somebody who listens to you, right? So the art of listening is really the art of healing. And kinesiology for me is how I listen to you. Uh, so... I'm going to share a little, little bit about that you know, throughout the weeks, uh, a little bit tonight as well. Um, how, we, how we access the intelligence of your body and listen to it so that we know, you know what, what's needed for your own healing. Uh, obviously, um, pain is a huge topic and there's many different causes of pain, so we saved you a seat. <laughs> Just got started. So. Pain's a huge topic. There's so many different causes. Obviously, I'm not going to cover every different aspect of pain. Um, but uh, you know, I imagine people who are interested in coming tonight are dealing with pain at some level. So um, you know, I'll share with you uh, some basic things that we can do and some different causes, and uh, also. You know, as a as a gift for you being here, is I'd, I'd be happy to you know in the next week or two um, give you a free evaluation, so we can kind of figure out you know what what might be causing any pain that that you're you're having as well. Um, so I'll, I'll demonstrate that on a couple people how how I do that, and then um, you know, open that up to you if you if you'd like a you know, personal consultation. Um, yeah, why, why are we in pain? The first thing I wanted to talk about is movement. Uh, you know, we kind of live in a sedentary society. We don't move around like we did you know, as in uh, you know, pre-modern times, I guess. And the chairs are set up so we're slouched and we're sitting in the cars. And, um, so a lot of our pain is you know, because we don't move as much as we used to. So um, I'm going to show you the first thing I want to show you, and we'll all do it together. It'll be a, we'll get up and, and do it. Um, is uh, you know I got the concept that that dentistry has done a terrific job of uh, getting us to spend three minutes a day to prevent the decay of our teeth. But you know physical therapists, chiropractors, we've done a miserable job of teaching people to spend three months to prevent the decay of our spine, which, you know, it, it wouldn't be too debatable that our spine is even more important. I mean, you can replace some teeth, but you can't really replace your, your vertebrae and your spine. Once, once it's all gotten arthritic, it's like, you know, we've got some drugs to sell you to <laughs> keep you somewhat comfortable, I suppose. But, um, if we can prevent the decay of our spine, that would be worth three minutes. So I'm going to show you a three-minute exercise. Uh, maybe you could do it while you brush your teeth. <laughs> yeah, so. <coughs> Multitask, as women are great at, right? Now. So um, let's stand up. I'll show you. Actually, let me demonstrate it for you first, and then we'll do it together, because it's hard to do it when we're all kind of bowing. So there's three planes of motion that the spine moves. And the reason we do this is because by the time we're about 12 or 13, our discs lose blood supply. The, the, the blood supply to our discs, like, you, you never see a 10-year-old kid a hurting aid in a disc, right? The discs, you know, become dehydrated and wear out and they become more brittle. And by the time we're 30, 40, 50, you know, it's, you know, if you lift the wrong way, you can really <coughs> rupture, you know, a disc. So, to get fluids in and out of the disc, since there's no blood supply, it relies on spinal motion. Kind of like a sponge, you have to actually, you know, 
wring it out or, you know, kind of pump it in and, um, you know, get the debris out. So um, our body re relies on motion. So there's three planes of motion for the spine. And uh, they're front to back. So if we flex the spine, I do about one every three seconds. So if you do 20, that, that corresponds to about a minute. Um, second plane is side to side. Now, when I evaluate older people, this is what tends to get lost the most. You know, we, we're pretty good at flexing, extending. Sometimes extension gets a little bit limited, but lateral bending gets really limited. So. So we'll do that. Sometimes people will go down a lot farther on one side than the other. And then the third one is rotation. People tend to forget that their head is part of their, you know, their neck's part of their spine, so they do these rotations. So mm -hmm. I want you to do is look as far behind you. And what I do is I bring this arm behind me so it gets a nice shoulder stretch as well. And while you're doing this, look what happens to the knees, so you get a nice stretch in the knee joints as well. So <clears throat> three minutes of this a day, or, or if you're at the computer and kind of getting stiff, you can get up and do do a minute or so of this and it's a great you know break in the middle of the day or if you're in a car long car ride and you get off at a rest stop it's you know, a great thing to kind of give your give your muscles a little break so why don't we stand up and give it a try And we can do a little yoga breath too. So as we go down, you exhale. Inhale, go back. Oh, exhale, go down. Inhale, back. If it hurts, uh, you know, let pain be your guide. So don't, <coughs> don't push it too far. Exhale. We'll do like eight, no, just for the sake of it. Exhale down, drop your head. Inhale back, bring your head back. There we go. Good, very nice. Exhale down. Inhale back. Great. So it's not it's not bowing. We're not bending. We don't need to bend at the waist like this. It's just compressing the spine like there. And then back. So you know, touching the toes. Toes, that, that's great, but um, that's, that's not a spinal motion. Mm -hmm. All right, good. How does that feel? Yeah? Okay, so now this one will exhale down. Ear to shoulder. Exhale down. The inhale happens all by itself, so just exhale as you go down. So if you do... At this speed, you can do 20 each side in a minute. So if you want to count to 20 or have a clock. Or if it's comfortable, drop your ear to the shoulder. Just let that stretch. Also, if you're, gonna, if you're, if you're somebody who likes to do static stretching, it's good to do this first because with the speed you're doing at, it's actually warming up the muscles. So things stretch a lot better if they're warm. You know, think about plastic. You know, if you heat it up, it can bend. So our bodies are kind of plastic. If you, if you warm it up, then it's, you can remodel it better. Okay, great. Now the twisting. Turn the head. Everyone forgets the head. And try to bring your, yeah, there you go. Arm behind your back. Very nice. Get a nice shoulder stretch there. This is somebody I, this is a technique I picked up from somebody about 15 years ago. I thought, wow, that, this is really a thing to remember. So morning's good for this. Um, <clears throat> the flexion, the spinal flexion, if you have low back issues, Especially in the morning, the, 
the spinal flexion can sometimes be aggravating. So if, if it feels uh, a little painful, the flexion part on your spine, then just do extension and to neutral. Extension and to neutral. Later in the day when your back's warmed up, the flexion uh, should be more comfortable. But that's the only one that I would uh, be cautious of. Just kind of like, you, you know, you don't want to bend like this and pick something up. So for the same reason, this can be a little bit of a strain on the low back if, if you do have low back issues. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's a great general, a great general uh, movement. Uh, it, you know, the reason why we get short when we get older is why, it, yeah, the discs become dehydrated. So the discs actually are a third of the height of your spine. So if those become what they call desiccated or dehydrated, uh, well, so this, if you drink, if you get well hydrated, here's another thing, get well hydrated before you do this, because your, your discs are actually joints. Or, or, or actually, sorry, your discs are actually um, ligaments. The ligaments connect bone to bone. So the discs in that vertebrae to vertebrae. Well, your, your joints, your ligaments, they get last priority for hydration. So if you drink water, your brain gets first priority, all your other organs get second priority. If they're topped off, then your body goes, okay, I'll allocate some water to your joints. So um, you want to be hydrated. That's number three here. So, <laughs> so get hydrated before you do this so that there's some water to pump into your discs to begin with. Right. And the way to get hydrated, I have people who say, oh, I drink a gallon of water a day, and they still test that they're dehydrated. It's because um, they drink it all at like three or four times in the day. They just like chug a couple of glasses of water. You can only absorb about four ounces every half hour. So your cell, everything else just... It's kind of like dumping a bucket of water on an ice cube tray. Most of it will just spill over. If you want to, the ice cube tray is analogous to your cells. So each little ice cube is like your cells. So your cells have these lipid membranes, right? And water and fats don't mix very well. In fact, until recently, I don't think, when I went to school, they didn't even know physiologically how water got through the membrane because the fat and water, you know, and there wasn't any like channels that were pumping it in. So um, water actually has a difficult time getting through the membrane. It doesn't happen quickly. So it's kind of like filling an ice cube tray. You kind of have to do it slowly and just like dump it on. So four ounces every half hour, everything else just gets peed out. So if you, what's four ounces? Um, yeah. Um, I've, I've held as much water as I could in my mouth. That was three ounces. So two like regular size sips. If you do two regular size sips, that's four ounces. So if you have, the only way you're going to do that is if you have water within arm's reach. So it, the, the, uh, the new, the new trick to uh, learn if you're not, if you're not somebody who always has a bottle of water within arm's reach, that's, that's the new habit to, uh, to adopt. Obviously, we've got to do things differently if we want to feel differently, right? So we have to talk about, okay, what new habits? Well, the one is motion. The next one is having a water bottle within arm's reach all the time. Ideally, not one made of cheap plastic, right? Glass or stainless steel, so you're not getting the xeno, xeno steroids or whatever they call it, the xeno estrogens, mm -hmm. which are chemically estrogen mimickers, so they kind of create disruption, endocrine disruptors, you know, it's bad news. You get babies with these plastic bottles, little baby girls, baby boys that are developing breasts, they're like two years old, you know, it's because these hormones, synthetic hormone-like substances in these plastic baby bottles, well, our cheap little plastic bottles, you know, made of the same stuff, so glass or stainless steel. 
So as we get all these chemicals in us, that's another thing is toxins cause pain in the body. So um, anyways, going, going in order here, I want to tell you about unwinding. Unwinding is a, a fun concept. Has anyone heard of unwinding? Yeah, I've heard of it. There's, there's, when we move and there's pain, it's because fascia is stuck. That's one reason. When we get, it's like, oh, okay. When there's an injury, the fascia can get kinked. And fascia is really tough stuff. It wraps every muscle and it's a head to toe. Uh, kind of like if you had chicken breast and put saran wrap around it. That saran wrap is like the fascia. Or if you have uncooked chicken and you see that white stuff, you know, on the top, that's the fascia. So it's between the muscle layers. It, it, it keeps um, adjacent muscles from uh, adhering to it. It keeps them from rubbing up against each other. So it creates a smooth surface in between the muscles so the muscles can move independently and they don't kind of get glued together. But it has a tensile strength of 2,000 pounds per square inch. So when that stuff gets kinked, um, it really limits your motion and uh, things can get painful. Um, I'm going to bring that rapid release thing in there. I forgot to get it. It's just kind of Thanks. So unwinding. Does anyone have like a neck pain or stiffness or anything? You want to come up here? It's a very gentle procedure. So. Let's have you talk. Oh, great. Yeah, right there. While you're up here, Julie, I'm going a million miles a minute. But this is Julie, and uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, Julie invited me here last August, September, or something like this. Yeah. She's had this clinic for how long? Three years. Three years. Wow. And she, you know, her vision was for it to be, you know, like a total wellness center, and um, she does amazing. Slow. Esthetician work. Oh, yeah. Describe your your work. I do uh, esthetician, or not esthetician, but aesthetic skincare. So I do anything from aging to sun damage to kids with acne. So I'm dermatology. I'm always like a hawk, looking at everybody, to make sure they don't have anything unusual to get seen. Um, I've been doing it ten years as a specialty. Before that, I did emergency room stuff. So I just find that you know I like to take the natural route with that process of aging and so that kind of defines my work in general. Beautiful. I don't want to take up your no, stage, no, no, no. That was that was a great summary. So you work under the license of a yeah, surgeon PA, in town. physician assistant. So yep. we ultimately have to have a supervisory position. Mm -hmm. So she can remove stuff and do like mm -hmm. little stitches and or, um, you know cryotherapy. So obviously you put um, frozen in the so if any skin issues at all, she's she's got all the yeah, we've got all the tools. Um, I was <coughs> would you be interested uh, having her do a whole talk and kind of showing her all the tools? Yeah, showing all the awesome yeah. models. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so we're gonna yeah. have her do a talk here in, in a couple of weeks or so, some sometime in this month. Yeah. And, uh, I'll have her back good to here. see you guys back. I'm sorry I didn't introduce you oh, earlier. No, it's okay. Just, it's, it's my so brain's good. gone a million miles. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. <laughs> Great. So she has cards and flyers up here too, if you're interested. Let's have you uh, put your head up here on your back. <clears throat> so unwinding is this amazing thing where you just, um, you just hold the head and the fascia unwinds itself. It just moves. And it'll look like I'm moving it, and for her it might feel like I'm moving her head here, but I'm, I'm just along for the ride. Her fascia is going to do the moving. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I just hold it. It sometimes takes a few seconds. So just let it go. Once it starts going, essentially it's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to find a good analogy. It's like water, flowing water that meets a barrier. It's trying to find a way through it and around it. 
Well, it's yeah. like a hose, a garden hose that get, has a kink in it. Yeah. And then you let go of the kink. So, so are you happening? pulling it? Are you pulling her I've head? got a slight traction going, but then her head just... Is that what triggers it to want to yeah. unwind? Mm -hmm. Because usually we don't just have our neck relaxed enough for it to start moving. And what it's doing is it's searching for restricted spots and then trying to find a way around it, through it. Just stop there. So we can't do this to ourselves, though. You can. And I was you, gonna, oh, you could do it. I'm going to show you. Here we go. Now this will go on for 30 minutes if we let it. <laughs> before it comes to a stop. But it's the phenomenon. How does that feel? Is it nice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just going. You know, sometimes we can do it in a seated, seated position. I'll hold it. And It'll go all the way back. And it's pretty interesting stuff. So if you just hold that, it'll find its own way. So what I found with chiropractic is I could pop the bones, but the soft tissue was still restricted. I could rub it real hard and all that, but um, just by listening gently, it just kind of unwinds itself. It takes a few sessions sometimes, but it's a, it's a very gentle process. and um, it's, it's something I... Uh, I find is very effective, very gentle, uh, and it kind of takes your body as quickly, you know, just just kind of stretching it here and stretching it there. Uh, it doesn't quite do the trick. We've got, you know, by the time a kid's five, they've, they've had 2,000 falls. <laughs> you know, when kids are first starting to walk, so we're all... We have all these asymmetries and muscle imbalances and injuries. I mean, you know, not to mention, you know, sports injuries, car accidents, pillow fights, you know, all the things our bodies have been through, right? Um, so there's a lot of stuff to work out and you can't always do it quickly, right? So this is a, a process where it just kind of unravels itself or unwinds itself. So what... Um, how you do it yourself is you just kind of drop your head. You, you got to be patient. So like when you have 20 minutes or 15, 15 minutes, I mean, even five or 10, you can get, get the experience. Just kind of drop your head and just relax. I kind of look like a zombie or something. <laughs> Somebody comes in the room. I just came back from New York a couple days ago. I was doing this on the plane. And I was like, oh. <laughs> wonder what I look like. <laughs> so, yeah, just look like I'm stretching. So, yeah, you just drop the head and just let it go. And just, just relax it and just... So uh, you don't move it intentionally. No. You just drop it and then it does yeah. what it wants to do. You just kind of wow. have to relax it while it falls. <laughs> yeah. So you could do it while you're meditating then, right? You can, yeah. I do it all the time. I mean, um, yeah, this is something that a practitioner can't really do for you too much. I mean, I, I do it somewhat, but um, it takes a lot of time, you know, and unless you have unlimited resources. You know, it, um, you know it's, it's probably something that you can do it, you know, along with your spinal motion. Um, you know, I always tell people, if, if you have a half hour, just spend a half hour to take care of your own, you know, body, whether it's a yoga class or these kind of stretches. Um, and the alternative is, you know, as we get older, we get stiffer. Um, and so if you don't want to get stiff and arthritic and in pain and stuff like that, it, it, takes, uh, it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of work. So hydration, hydration's another issue as we get older, the thirst signal goes down. We don't realize we're thirsty or our bodies are thirsty. Uh, I think it might just be part of the natural, <coughs> you know, when, when children are born, 
they're ninety percent hydrogen. <coughs> you know, their bodies are ninety percent water. By the time we're dead, we're about forty percent hydrated. So the whole aging process is one of slowly drying out. <laughs> so if we want to, if we want to, you know, if we don't think that sounds so good, then um, even though we don't maybe have thirst signals, just just sipping. So think about that. Four ounces every half hour. That's eight ounces an hour. Twelve hours a day alone gets you to ninety-six ounces. They say drink half of your weight in in ounces of water. So, so let's say you're a hundred fifty-pound person. That's this. The recommendation is seventy-five ounces. So that's in only twelve hours a day. You can get ninety-six hour uh, ounces. You know, just doing two sips every half hour. So. Um, so it's it's about consistency. It's about sipping. And that's that's the way we actually hydrate our cells as opposed to <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but tea, coffee, do you have that? Well caffeine is a dehydrator. It's it's actually something that you end up eliminating more water than you end up drinking. So uh, juice, decaffeinated tea, water, those things all count, you know, as water. Um, if you get one of the reasons I think people don't drink water is if you don't unless you have a really good reverse osmosis filter or something the water just doesn't taste that good. When I started, you know, when I got some good quality water, it actually my body craved it. Mm -hmm. What so, about the alkalized water yeah. they sell? Yeah, it, no there's a lot of a lot of debate around alkalized water. If you look at the pH scale, it's 0 to 14, so below 7 is acid, right? It's kind of like the Richter scale. Be between a 6 and a 7 is a tenfold difference, kind of like the earthquakes. So uh, six, a 6 is 10 times more acidic than a 7, so it's kind of like that. Uh, that whole scale is built on the idea that water is 7. So seven is water, what water should be. Of course, there's different types of water. Um, you know, the argument is that we eat acidic diets, a lot of sugar, a lot of caffeine, high protein, all those things are acidic. Well, our blood is 7.4. It sounds like just above neutral, but it's a Richter scale, right? It's a tenfold scale. So 7.4, if you go down to 7.0, you go into a coma. So your body's pH is something that uh, your body regulates very tightly. It'll sacrifice many other things to keep your pH, your blood pH, at a 7.4 or thereabouts. So what's alkalinizing? What, if you eat acidic foods, you have to counterbalance it with something alkaline. What's alkaline? Minerals. Minerals are alkalizing. Well, our soil in America right, is depleted because of mass agriculture. The soil, there's no minerals in the topsoil. So the Senate did a report that showed that 97% of us are deficient in minerals. So they think, well, okay, let's alkalinize the water. Well, our bodies are designed to get our alkalinity from food. Uh, the, Recommendation is that 70% of our food should be from the alkaline side. What's alkaline? Fruits and vegetables. There's a few fruits like dates, super sweet things that are acidic. But for the most part, and there are so, it's a con confusing thing. It's like the most alkaline form in food is lime. A lime or a lemon. It's in it, of itself it's acidic, but when it enters the body it becomes alkaline forming because of what it combines with. So, a little bit of a confusing subject, but lots of fruits and vegetables, which most people don't eat, and don't eat enough of. And even if they do, you know, a lot of the vegetables and fruits are, from mass agriculture are lacking the minerals. So, um, water's supposed to be neutral. It's supposed to be cleansing. We're not supposed to be getting our nutrition from water. Um, so that's the argument against alkaline water. 
there's lots of arguments for it. Um, but that argument seemed to make sense to me. That we should ideally be getting our alkalinity from our food and water should be cleansing and you know, hydrating. Um, so that's, that's my take on that. So let me show you. Anyone want to test to see how well hydrated they are? I'll show you through muscle testing. Check, come on up. We'll get you next. <laughs> we'll check you for essential fats. Go ahead up here. Okay. Have you ever had muscle testing? I have a long time ago. Okay. So the way kinesiology, which is what I've been doing for 22 years, I've spent the last three years teaching it teaching my system. I've developed a system over the last 15 years uh, because the techniques I learned were too complex and there was only a couple people in the world who had actually learned it. And I thought, wow, this is great work, but it's too complicated. So I spent a lot of years learning how to boil it down to its essential principles so it could be taught in two weekends instead of the years it took me to get really good at it. So the idea is we're it's called muscle testing, but we're not actually testing muscles. The, the information, your brain has the information, right? Your brain, your subconscious mind is like your computer. But I can't get my hands directly on your brain, but your brain also operates your muscles. So hold nice and strong, hold strong there. Okay, so that muscle is locked. So the brain either it, it sends electricity to the muscle and the muscle turns on. See, like if I flex my bicep, my tricep turns off. See, my bicep does this, my tricep does that. If they both turn on at the same time, my, my arm couldn't move. You understand? Hmm. So, if I flex my finger, my finger extensor muscles have to turn off. So if you think of a guitarist going that fast, the nerves are turning on and off so, yeah. so fast. So nerves and muscles turn on and off. It's the most common phenomenon. So we're just using that phenomenon. So what, tell me your name again. Ginny. Ginny. So say something. So I'm going to have her say something that's true, like, hey, my name is Ginny. My name is Ginny. What's strong? She's a strong woman. That's about as hard as I can push. Um, now say something that's not true, like, your name is Tell me. Okay. Uh, I live in uh, San Diego. Okay. So with my pinky, ah, here's a little tough. Usually you can get it down with a pinky. So you live in San, you live in San Diego. Okay. So a little harder. She lives in San Diego. Okay. Her name is Jenny. <laughs> as hard as I can push. So using that, using that simple, you know, parlor trick. We can make a statement and see if it's true or not true. Yeah, she's really strong. You want to try to push on her arm? You won't get it down. <laughs> um, so what we can do, see, the body will give us yes-no answers. This is another kind of breakthrough that I made about 10 years ago. Was just, let's say we want to ask her, are you well hydrated? And the body says yes, no. So strong equals yes or true. You know, her name is Jenny, true, it holds strong. She lives in San Diego, false, it goes weak. So uh, if we say, are you well hydrated? What if she's like 75% hydrated? Is, is that good or bad? Right? See how it's not black and white? So I figured out a way that we can uh, phrase it or make a statement so that her body will actually calibrate. So there's such a thing as perfect hydration where all the cells have all the water they optimally need. And so what we're going to do is um, ask her body, we're going to ask her body how closely uh, her level of hydration is to optimal. So if I make a statement that her body is over 60% hydrated, hold. I push and she holds very strong. Meaning? What does that mean? True. That's a true statement. See how easy this is? <laughs> so her body's over 70% hydrated. That's true. Her body's over 80% hydrated. That's true. 
Jenny's body is over 90% hydrated. That's false. I'll show you just how incredible her body is. It's a, it's a phenomenon that our body can calibrate things like that. It can calibrate how healthy each organ is. It can, we can find out what foods you know, her body wants and doesn't want. Like if we say her body, her body uh, wants uh, bread. It's really weak. So you can, you can find out what foods, you know, her alert. You know. If we say all of her organs can easily handle wheat, that goes weak too. So that's a question to see. Because it might be like neutral, like it doesn't want it, but it doesn't really bother her, but it, it actually bothers her. Is that true? Uh -huh. Yeah. So much easier way than getting blood tests and doing traditional allergy tests. Just ask the body. So she, we know she's between 80 and 90 percent hydrated. She's over 82 percent hydrated, over 84 percent, over 85, over 86, over 87 percent hydrated, over 88, over 89. <laughs> so it's over 88, but not over 89. So it's 88 percent hydrated. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so what I'll do, you know, if you each come and get evaluated, I'll show you what your essential fatty acid levels are, what your hydration levels are, um, what foods you might be allergic to, things like that. That'd be useful to know. So you can tell if you're gluten intolerant or something like that? Yeah. Like that. Well, what we could do, she, she obviously doesn't like wheat, right? Her, her, her body doesn't like wheat. But allergies are on like a, you know, if you ate it, you probably wouldn't die. You know, like people that get a bee sting, you know, can be life-threatening. Or, you know, the peanut allergies can be life-threatening, right? So on a scale of 1 to 10, that, that'd be a 10 allergy, right? 1 is like, 1 or 2 is like slight irritation, right? So we could actually calibrate how allergic she is. Like for wheat, on a scale of 1 to 10, how allergic is she? More than a 2? Yes. More than a 3? More than a 4? More than a 5? So a 4 to a 5 as far as her sensitivity levels. Very different from someone with celiac where it's like, a, you know, might be an 8 or a 9. So you can calibrate how severe something is. While you're here and now that you're muscle testing really well. Um, no, I'll get to that later. I want, I want is it, show me who's uh, never experienced muscle testing before. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Good job. Well hydrated, 88%. That's not too bad. Not too bad. I'm drinking not your tea. <laughs> yeah. good, good. Who, who has never been muscle tested before? Not never? fully. Not fully? Okay. So most people have. You've been muscle tested before? You've had it? Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so essential fatty acids, uh, really good for the brain. Uh, <clears throat> good for the brain. They they found it um, helps anxiety, but it also helps our joints greatly. So it has things that uh, cytokines are the chemical markers of inflammation in the body, and it lowers cytokines. So what this study showed was that. Uh, they tested medical students, like just before their big exams, you know, like like the hell week in medical school, right? <laughs> where they're all stressed out. And they did, they measured their cytokine levels and uh, our interleukin, um, interleukin is, is a chemical that makes cytokines. And so they, they, they had a placebo as well, and so they 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 measured their their anxiety levels and their um, cytokine levels, and showed essential fatty acids um, greatly reduced both of those. So, you you know how pregnant women get? What's the word they call it when pregnant women get? Uh, Glow. Well, when they get kind of like mentally foggy, like 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 ditzy. Have you heard the term like where they forget stuff? It's because when a baby's developing, it's if the if the woman doesn't have enough essential fatty acids, it will take it from the woman's brain. 
for the development of babies. Yeah. Do they get a bed? That's a good question. Yeah, if they if they eat enough omega threes. See the problem That's with happening. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, most of the oils uh, have too much omega six. It's out of balance. So omega six will actually produce inflammation. So you have to have a, a supplement or a source or you know fish that has the right balance of omega-3, omega-6. So we're getting too much omega-6 and it's actually promoting inflammation. So staying well hydrated, you know, eating foods that are more alkalinizing, uh, detoxing, you can do like juice, you know, a couple times a year, doing like a juice fast for a couple of days. Um, you know, finding which foods are inflammatory. My, my cousin's done a tremendous amount of work um, on finding what foods, you know, genetically were, were designed to eat and cause the least amount of inflammation. And, um, <clears throat> and what, what, he's, what he's found is that, I mean, I used to think like shellfish was inflammatory, but apparently it's a really good, um, yeah, a good source of protein. Um, a, a lot of the problems is we're eating uh, the wrong types of oils. Uh, what, we, what we should be cooking with is coconut and butter. Coconut and butter, they're saturated fats. You know how every 10 years they say, oh, tofu's good, tofu's bad, eggs exactly. are good, eggs are bad. Saturated fats are good or bad, whatever. Well, there's good or bad, whatever, they're stable. So when you cook them, saturated means chemically all the hydrogen bonds are filled up. So as a molecule, it's, it's stable. It can't be twisted. A twisted fat molecule is a trans fat. It's it's uh, molecularly molecularly unrecognizable by your body. So it's like it, it body treats it like an allergen. It's like what do we do with it? It can't excrete it. And it's a <clears throat> weird thing. So if you're going to heat something, you want a saturated fat. Coconut, coconut and butter have a lot of saturated fats. They're good. Uh, you can use olive oil, it's great, but it's not the ideal cooking oil because it's not that high in saturated fats. It, it can be denatured <coughs> more easily. And then avocado is a great oil. So I would risk keep our oils to those, those four things because um, the other ones will have high omega-6s. Um, so getting the right types of fat. And then uh, I put Far infrared sauna, I want to do a whole talk on that. Um, I got one last week. Where is it? That's not it. No, it's not here. It's actually at my house. So uh. Y'all can come over on the weekend. <laughs> Bring your bathing suits. And <clears throat> no, but seriously, I, I wanted to make it available. Um, but I, you know, I didn't want to have it here where people would come out and dripping and there's nowhere to shower off. And, you know, it just becomes a... Turkey's bath here or something. So, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Julie didn't think that was a great idea. I was all for it, but uh, <laughs> but um, essentially, what it does, uh, most saunas just heat up the air, and you sweat a lot of water. This special, it's a special sauna. It's a special type of infrared sauna. I don't want to go into a lot more detail, but there's this guy. This guy who knows a guy. No. Uh, and he, he was trying to figure out, you know, what wavelength actually penetrates the skin. And he found the, what the right wavelength is, 9.4 microns. And so he created a heater that generates a lot of infrared at that wavelength. So that you can get in two to three inches deep, heat up the fat, and dump toxins as opposed to just sweating water. So if somebody's had chemotherapy or you just want to do a detox or, um, or if you have viruses, once you raise your, your um, the, the, uh, the medical association here sent some people over to Germany where they were doing these hyperthermia uh, therapies for people with cancer where they raise your core temperature up to like 106 and people are getting well from cancer. Because when you raise your core temperature, mutagens, mutated cells, 
as well as viruses start dying. When you raise your core temperature even about you know half a degree or a degree, those things start dying. That's why your body does a fever. Does a fever. Yeah, to kill those cells. So this creates, instead of an intense 106 degree core temperature, this raises it a couple degrees. You do that look, if you have a virus or cancer or something like that. You raise that a few times a week. You can take it, and that's a great you know, complementary therapy you can be doing. Or if somebody's had chemotherapy, how to get that out of your body? This is a great way to do that. So for thirty dollars a session, you can go in there for forty-five minutes or so and get a really powerful detox. So, anyways, I'm gonna have a presentation about that at some point. <clears throat> um, what time are we at? 740. 740? Oh, okay. What we're going to try to do every week is <clears throat> pull this off in about an hour. I want to give you a lot of information. And, um, yeah, if we're going to do it every week, um, I think an hour is probably uh, as long as we probably want to go.